Welcome to the 22nd episode of the Professional Go podcast. I'm your co-host, Barry Moltz. Professional On The Go is a show that will give you the inspiration, the tips and the tools on how to win and live your best life as an independent professional. My co-host is Chinwe Onogoro, who's the CEO of Pocket Suite, which is an office in your pocket for independent service professionals. It's the mobile business application that helps self-employed professionals get booked, paid, and make extra income to run their own business from the palm of their hand. Chinwe, it's great to be in the same room with you to record this podcast. Barry, welcome to San Francisco. This is fabulous. You brought the sun with you. Uh, it's great to be here. It's such a vibrant place for small business owners doing all sorts of interesting kinds of things. Absolutely. From technology to retail to financial services and more. Well, you know, it used to be that only very wealthy people hired personal trainers. Now, Chin Wei, it seems like everybody has one. Have they become more affordable or has something changed perhaps with technology? I think there are two things. I think there is a, a sort of a, a new virtue within society that, um, that you've got to be in shape and you've got to care about and invest in your health. And hiring a personal trainer is a signal of that commitment. So I think there's a lot of that. And I also think that it's all part of the overall sort of shift we're seeing in society to, society to on demand, right? So we've got driver on demand with Uber. We've got a great exotic place to stay on demand with Airbnb. You've got your food being delivered by Instacart, your, your uh, products being delivered by Amazon. So everything's on demand. Why not uh, also have somebody who is uh, focused on you and provides personalized services with personal training. So do you think because there's more demand for personal training, people really value their health now and are gonna do something about it, that has made more people to pursue the career of personal training because you just don't have to do it in a gym anymore. Absolutely, I mean, I think people realize that gym membership is not enough. And I think the gyms have really developed a very bad reputation of you know signing you up for these memberships uh, and then sort of hoping you don't come, right? They never have enough towels, never have enough uh, right. equipment, right? They, they, they're assuming that you are not going to come. They, they prey on you, come the new year, January, the, the membership skyrocket. And then by March, you know, they've tanked again. And the gyms are fine because they lock you into multi-year membership programs. So I think people are fighting back. They're seeing the dollars they've spent on that strategy and how it hasn't worked. And so they really want somebody who's really a personal coach, somebody who will hold them accountable to do the thing that none of us really want to do, with few exceptions, right? So you really need an accountability partner more than anything. You on your own could watch a YouTube video and figure out the moves, you know, injury rate aside, uh, but it's really the accountability that people are looking for. And that's really where a personal trainer can add a lot of value. Yeah, I think one of the things that the gyms are trying to do is they're trying to prevent the constant turnover. As you said, we all know that people join gyms mostly on January 1st, and of course, then they quit them mostly on <laughs> February 1st, although they probably invested a huge amount of money up front. They're looking for some type of stickiness, a reason for people to come. And I know when I've worked out with personal trainers, I may not want to go to the gym, but if I have an appointment, I feel an obligation to actually be there. That's absolutely right. And that's the, you know, that's one of the most powerful tools that personal trainers have is they make a commitment to you. And so you feel like you need to make a commitment to them, right? It's not really a commitment to achieving your fitness goals. It's a commitment to them to show up and to do the work. And that is enough to help you make progress. I also feel as I go through a lot of cities in the U.S., there's, of course, a Starbucks in every corner. But now there seems like to be some kind of gym on every single corner. There really there really are. So more and more boutique gyms are popping up. These are gyms that are much more focused, much more specialized. They have special kinds of equipment. You'll see a lot of CrossFit gyms where they have you know, equipment that folks who train for the Olympics and train for it really competitive um, events and sports are using. And I think the average person wants to feel as though, you know, they're Superman or Superwoman. And these boutique gyms make you feel like you're doing something more than just the traditional treadmill that you'll find at a gym. But it also seems to me that all of these gyms have some kind of theme where, Chinway, it's much more than working out. It's trying. To, they're also trying to put a community together so people can feel like they're a part of something because We've talked about this previously. There's so many of us that are so disconnected, one of the reasons being technology. 
Yeah, the gym has always been a, a social place for folks. And the bigger the gym, the more, um, I would say, distant you are because you can't possibly know all of the folks that are, go in and out. But a small boutique gym where you are, get a chance to meet with people, someone spots you here, you spot them there, uh, it makes a big difference. And again, it's an additional motivation to show up just to see those other people and make progress together. Are we seeing also these coaches get into not only physical training, but really the holistic part of what people eat and also the choices they make in their lives? Yeah, I, we're definitely seeing that, right? So all of the studies and data show that 80% of your physical fitness comes from nutrition and what you sort of eat. Um, and so, you, you know, t that 20% is important, but the 80% is the ball game. So more and more fitness trainers are actually learning and, and um, going th through training and certifications to learn a bit more about nutrition and how to advise and coach folks in that domain. And we're personally seeing fitness trainers actually incorporating nutrition counseling sample menus in their overall packages to their clients, um, which of course is an additional revenue stream, but it's also creates some stickiness and hopefully helps folks make progress against their goals. So this is again, not one of those businesses. And I don't know, Chinway, which business is where you just show up and declare, I'm a personal trainer and people beat a path to your door. You actually have to go out and build this business, right? Cause it's just like any other personal services business. It's one person at a time. There's no question. I think the most successful fitness trainers, personal trainers have gone through some kind of certification. There is no formal licensing required to become a personal trainer. Um, however, again, there's differentiation in the market. Your clients are looking for someone who has expertise. There's definitely liability that comes with injury. And so if you're not trained to be able to protect your clients from injuries, that could create a huge problem. I will say though that, you know, again, with the rise of Instagram and Facebook and other social media, ultimately, you know, you've got to sell yourself. So those folks with, you know, the best bodies, great, you know, six packs and, you know, bikini bodies can also present themselves as experts in the field because they've done it for themselves. Whether or not they have certification, whether or not they have training is something that, you know, the, the individual client really has to investigate because um, you really don't want to, to go too far down the road with someone who maybe has done it for themselves, not sure how, but isn't necessarily qualified to, to really train you in that area. And I think that personal trainers, Chen, we also have to think about what really sets them apart from everybody else, because it's not just enough to be a personal trainer. What is your philosophy and what are you trying to help people actually achieve? No question. We spoke to uh, Amanda Tress earlier and she talked a lot about um, sort of sustainability and community, right? So making sure that from a philosophical perspective, folks are doing uh, the kind of training that they can sustain over the long haul um, so that over, over time they can actually sustain the results they want. Um, so that's just one philosophy. There are others that really are focused on intensity. And, you know, you can you can make the workout short, but make it high intensity. You'll get a lot more calorie burns. You'll get a lot more. Um, you'll make a lot more progress than if you do kind of low intensity over a long period of time. So different trainers have different philosophies. In many cases, you know, if you ask 10 trainers, you know, what's the right approach, you'll get 11 answers. So much like economists. Um, so ultimately, it really is about what works best for you and, and what kind of values do you have and to what extent those values are aligned with the trainers that you choose. Now, I think it's the first time, Chinway, I've ever heard compared trainers to economists. <laughs> <laughs> one is uh, one is uh, making predictions about your body. The other is making uh, predictions about our economy, you know, about our country. So, you know. You know, I just started with a new trainer. And I when I was going to book with him, the first question he asked me was, what are you trying to achieve by working with me? And I think that's important no matter whether you're a trainer, whatever type of service profession you are. And for me, I want to work getting a stronger core because I'm a big cyclist. I wasn't didn't really care about getting bigger muscles or losing weight. Yeah, you know what's interesting? You know, fitness training, much like life coaching, much like therapy, much like dog training, these are service professions where the partnership is critical, right? You can go to a hairstylist and they can do all the work and you look beautiful at the end. There's no work. You sit in a chair, you relax. But there are many other service professions like fitness training where it's a it's a give get, right? And so the, the trainer can lead you to water, but you really have to lean in and drink. And so asking you about your goals is the first step to understanding your intentions. And that's the, ne and the next step is really about creating commitments around those intentions. And that's really where a personal trainer can, can add value. If you don't have intentionality, it's really hard to make a commitment. And then it's really hard for a personal trainer to help you sustain that commitment. 
So the key in this business, just like with so many other personal service businesses, you've got to get repeat clients. So where do things usually go sideways between the fitness trainer and their clients? Yeah, it's tricky. So there are a lot of things that um, that fitness trainers have run into over the years in working with clients. I think the number one thing is something I've been repeating over and over on this show is commitment breaking. When you begin that work, you set a goal and you make a series of commitments and the personal trainer can guide you through those commitments, but those commitments are effectively a promise to them and to yourself. In some cases, fitness trainers even make you sign an agreement so that it's very clear and documented what the agreed upon plan is to help you achieve your goals. And oftentimes you'll see clients breaking those goals. That's number one. The second is expectation mismanagement. And this I would put in the squarely in the hands of the pro, right? If you tell me your goal is to you know, go from 200 pounds to 80 pounds within three weeks, as a professional, as somebody who is has a code of conduct and responsibility, I've got to set your expectations that that is not realistic. And if I don't do that, there is a really, really strong chance that at the end of our work together, you are going to be unsatisfied with the outcome. And that, I think, is, is where the work goes sideways and the relationship really falls apart. But I think one of the things is the trainer, Chen Wei, has to have the courage to say, this is not possible. Again, just like any other kind of business, the client says, this is what my goal is. And if you know you can't achieve that in the period of time they set, if you really want to have a good relationship with this person, it's up to you to say, no, that just won't work. And you know, again, tr as a recovering management consultant, <laughs> I am somebody who is very well practiced in helping people understand when their ideas or when their goals are not realistic. And there's a way to do it without saying no. What you do is you break down what has to be true for that goal to be achieved. So you talk about how much how much less calories they have to intake. You talk about how, how much they have to run every day. And so when you start to break down the how, it becomes very clear when that individual is sort of shocked by what they will have to do to, to achieve those goals. So you didn't say no, you simply laid out what would have to be true, and that itself really helps somebody understand what's a more realistic goal to set. So, of course, just like with everything else, how does the personal fitness trainer handle the whole budget and money side of this? Yeah, I mean, that's another area of uh, sort of relationships going sideways. I think people will be gung-ho about getting their own personal trainer, about making progress on looking you know, their best. Um, but oftentimes they don't think about the long-term investment that's required to really sustain the relationship. Um, so a classic situation is someone sets a goal. Uh, and they make a payment uh, towards that goal, and that payment really covers them, perhaps for the first month, maybe for the first three months. But this is a long-term relationship. We're talking about years, not months. And so what ends up happening is maybe some life change happens to them. You know, there's some change in their uh, in their salary. Maybe uh, you know, a family member needs some extra support, and they have to reallocate funds. Oftentimes, it's the discretionary uh, their discretionary income that they're using to pay for their personal training needs. And it's the first thing to cut. Um, but they don't actually sit down with their personal trainer beforehand and say, hey, something's changed in my life. How do we recast this budget to allow for this change? What ends up happening is they, they drag their feet on paying that trainer. And that trainer is, is in good faith continuing to provide that service until it's no longer uh, feasible for them to continue providing it. And there's money owed. And that always creates a relationship dynamic that's never fun. Yeah, no one wins there. Exactly. Well, Chin Wei, hang on a second. We'll be right back with our special guest. Pocket Suite is a mobile app that helps anyone earn a living by making it easy for clients to regularly book and pay you. People are always talking about going on their own, working for themselves, doing what they love. And you know, it's all so exciting until they get nervous about what to do next, how to schedule appointments, build customers and get paid. But it's so much easier now if you're great with pets can do hair, love helping people get in shape, give great massages or facials, or provide any kind of service, Pocket Suite can help you make up to $10,000 more a month. Pocket Suite helps you with all the marketing, scheduling client appointments, sending invoices, accepting credit cards, and messaging your clients all in one app. So just for listeners, they're offering a 15-minute 
Ask Me Anything call with one of their dedicated success team members to learn how Pocket Suite can help you. Schedule your free Ask Me Anything call. Just text them at 415-841-2300 with the promo code AMACALLPOTG. I'm really excited to introduce Billy Polson. Billy is an entrepreneur and founder and owner of D-I-A-K-A-D-I. That's Daya Kadi. Billy will correct my pronunciation, I'm sure. <laughs> Daya Kadi is based in San Francisco. It's the largest personal training facility in the Bay Area. Billy is also the founder of the Business Movement a program that will tell us more about that helps fitness entrepreneurs launch their businesses. Billy, thanks so much for joining us today. You're so welcome. You were so close. Diacati, but that was perfect. (laughs) (laughs) I am very familiar with names being butchered. My last name is Anya Goro, so I usually spell it out just to avoid confusion. (laughs) (laughs) That is perfect. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for letting me come on. Well, thank you for joining. You know, Billy, we have a lot of listeners who are in the health and wellness uh, business, some who are personal trainers, fitness trainers, um, and some who are, um, you know, thinking about stepping out on their own. So it would be great to just hear a little bit about you and how you got your start. What were you doing before um, you started uh, doing this business and, and what motivated you to get into fitness training? Most definitely. My background, I actually, I studied statistics in college and I headed into technology. Um, And technology paid the bills, but I was not feeling happy and fulfilled with it. And that is honestly what drove me into fitness. I loved uh, personal training. I loved working with people. uh, And it was wanting to be happy and fulfilled and honestly have the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. So in 1998, I left my technology job and uh, built my started building my independent training practice in San Francisco. Uh, six years after that, uh, we were, we had a practice in a a basement independent training gym in San Francisco, no windows. We didn't know when the sun came up or went down and, uh, we made a decision, you know, we've got to get out of this basement. And so in 2004, we built Diakati and, uh, Diakati was truly built as a facility for independent trainers and ideally it's a facility where they get all the benefits they would as if they were on staff at a large box or corporate gym, but in a facility where they have that freedom to run their business however they would like. And we also give them all the support, both on the fitness and the entrepreneurial training side of making sure that that business they're running is as, as successful as possible. So uh, that is what led us to uh, owning Diakati. It was honestly, again, getting out of the basement for freedom. And uh, about five years ago, we decided, you know what, all the entrepreneur training that we're doing in-house at Diakati, I, I really, I want fitness professionals everywhere to be as successful as our folks are here at Diakati. And so that's when we built the business movement. So the business movement is that entrepreneurial skills training specifically for fitness professionals. And we uh, carry that out through online guided course studies, as well as conferences and uh, virtual classrooms just to try and make sure that fitness pros have all the tools and resources and knowledge they need to build that business of theirs as big and successful as they would like it to be. So Billy, you're going to have to back up for me for a moment. You said something really um, sort of unusual earlier, which is you left, uh, you left a career in technology. These are six, (laughs) in some cases, seven figure jobs to uh, move into a basement with no windows and start a fitness business. So help me understand two things. One is what, what were the sort of confluence of events that led to that decision? And then why did you decide initially to set up your own fitness business rather than, you know, becoming an executive at crunch fitness or 24 hour fitness or um, some of the other kind of larger gyms that are out there? Right. You know, it's so funny. I, uh, no one's ever pointed out that fact that, yeah, I was looking for happiness and I headed into a basement. But uh, <laughs> it, it sounds outrageous, but that is truly the distinction of, for me at least, of sitting behind a desk computer programming all day versus 
being with folks that are, you're helping them live their best lives. And even if we were doing that in a grungy basement gym at the time, that was so much more fulfilling for me uh, than sitting behind that desk and just facing a computer all day. It was, it was that idea of helping boost someone's life in so many ways, whether it be uh, their physique and weight loss or their strength or getting them out of pain or just them being more comfortable and happy to get up out of bed every day. And that difference of uh, the fulfillment level of my job, that is what made the basement as bright and glowing as it could possibly be. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the Billy, end, did you, it, oh, go ahead. Billy, did you, did you actually have people coming to you while you were in tech asking you for help with fitness? Did you like, what were people trying to draw you in in some way asking for help? So you felt like, gosh, the, the market is calling me or were you sort of just kind of a gym rat and you really loved it and you wanted to spend all your time there? Like what was the, the thing that made you feel like this, this could work? So I, I loved fitness and working out myself was a big part of it. So I was at the gym an hour and a half, two hours a day myself, and I loved it. So that was a big part of it. The other thing, I tipped my toe into fitness by starting doing small group training. So I would work all day doing technology and at night I would go over to the gym and teach a group exercise class at night. And I did that a couple nights a week. And that, uh, that kind of introduction to it uh, helped me gain my confidence and gain my footing in the industry, as well as again, the fact that I was there every day and seeing people and I was getting results and they would ask me questions. So uh, again, it was following the things that I love to do in the environments that uh, were just felt like home for me. Wow. So you did something that we talk a lot about on the show, which is really talking about starting small and really doing uh -huh. something uh, starting from a place uh, where you love what you're doing and connecting with others who have a need in a small way, even if it means maintaining your day job until either the, the passion is so great um, and the conviction is so great or um, you get an opportunity that you just can't pass up. So that opportunity was the basement for you. So I get it. Um, <laughs> so I, <laughs> when you were spending that time in the basement, were there sort of really big challenges that you were facing that ultimately sort of pushed you to say, we've got to do more, we've got to do this differently? This can't be it. Right. And this kind of goes back to your uh, your um, previous question as well, where you ask, why did I not go and like work for a big box gym instead of doing my own thing? Uh, uh, the challenges that I was, that we really had when we were in that basement the industry was very young in 1998 uh and again way before any type of social media we had barely just gotten into web marketing um so one of the biggest challenges was trying to uh build my practice and locate folks who needed help so uh that really forced me to learn to be creative in how i would uh, get the word out and how I would attract folks to giving personal training a try. It was still uh, quite a luxury item at that point as well. Uh, over the last 20 years, it's definitely stepped into more of a day-to-day -day, uh, type of routine for folks. But uh, to break those boundaries down, we we tried lots of things. We would do uh, weekend workshops. We would go out and do boot camps on the beach. We tried anything and everything to try and slowly build a brand and build a practice. Um, and it, yeah, that I think, again, it really helped me get my work in the trenches to learn how to be creative and how to, to have grit and not giving up. And you just keep forging forward until it does feel like you found a key and you keep moving in that direction. So let's let's shift gears a bit because you, you talked a bit about how fitness and fitness training, having a fitness trainer used to be kind of a luxury item and now it's becoming a day to day thing. You know, anyone can, can have a, a professional trainer working with them. What, what were the things that happened in the marketplace that led to this shift? Are people just making more money? Are fitness trainers making less money? Like what, what, what are the dynamics that are sort of democratizing access to fitness trainers? What do you think? That's an excellent question. In my opinion, the, the first reason is because fitness trainers move beyond the realm of being uh, just bodybuilder physique trainers. They stepped out of 
that role where you just taught people how to use machines and really started helping people uh, become more in tune with their bodies and help them work through uh, any uh, imbalances or compensation, muscle compensation issues they had and headed more into corrective training. And slowly that helped people get out of pain and reverse the posture issues of sitting at a desk. So trainers slowly started to expand what they were offering on a skill set level. And that became a much more valuable item uh, for folks as opposed to folks telling them to do 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups. Uh, that's one of my big biggest points as well of, for like, for example, I went on uh, Yelp today in Chicago. I just was curious. All right. How many personal trainers are in Yelp in Chicago? There are thir- if you type in best personal trainer Yelp in Chicago, 1300 options come up. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's a, a completely flooded market and the saturation levels are crazy. If you type in gym, 3,300 options come up in uh, Yelp wow. in, Ch- in Chicago. So again, that same idea if you're still as a trainer, still just doing push-ups and sit-ups and having just really pushing people without heading into the direction of giving them a tool or product that they do need on a daily basis to help them get out of pain, to help them uh, repair posture issues and realign their body. Uh, those are the key opportunities for trainers to really stand out in this flooded, saturated market. So uh, that makes total sense. Um, I worked with personal trainers before and there is a real difference uh, between uh, someone who kind of puts their shingle out as a personal trainer and someone who has really kind of honed their craft um, and is really working in a programmatic way to help someone achieve their goals. So that makes total sense. I mean, so, so one of the questions I have for you is, you know, with 1300 personal trainers in, in Chicago, 3,300 gyms, like, when someone picks their head up and, and says, like, I need help, what kind of help are they needing and how do they find the business movement? Like, how do they find an organization like yours to provide them with that help? And when you're saying someone needing help, the trainer needing help as a business owner yeah. or the client? Exactly. The trainer basically saying, hey, how do I differentiate myself? I'm, I'm one of 1,300. Like, what, you know, what's my future, you know, in terms right. of this business? One hundred percent. And that idea of trying to, uh, again, step out of that sea of choices is tough because it's there's a new group fitness studio on every corner once a month. Like it's insane. So um, in terms of helping people do that, my first piece of advice, again, is to go to the clients that are the most frequent clients that need personal training. In my opinion, like at Diacati, almost every one of our clients that walks in the door is broken in some way and a little bit of pain, a little bit of imbalance needing like some type of assistance that is more than just telling them what exercises to do. It really involves being able to assess what's going on in their body. So uh, I go to that fact of look at your clients and see what are their most important needs that can't be fulfilled by the general fitness options that are everywhere. All the group training, all the online training, those are all general very rarely do they have an assessment element to them that truly helps you individualize the program for those folks. So that is my first piece of advice is figure out how to create a product that is truly unique and matches what your client's needs are. And in my opinion, that heads towards bridging the gap of trainers and physical therapists, not going into fitness trends, but going into things that folks will continue to need for the long run, which is, again, corrective therapy, uh, maybe even some manual therapy, uh, really trying to differentiate yourself in uh, a corrective and a a pain reduction type of uh, situation for your clients. So with that, I mean, that's highly specialized. How do you reconcile the growing craze around online training and, you know, sort of virtual training? I'm, I'm on a bike and I'm watching a trainer, you know, somewhere else in the world with a community of folks who are jamming with me. Like, how do you reconcile that? Can, they, can this craze live alongside of the more specialized, hands-on, in-person training that you, you support? Most definitely. And the biggest difference is the folks who are able to do uh, the bikes at home and all the online workouts and 
And the, again, the millions of program offerings in terms of even like small group training, the, the studios that are coming out, all the folks that are doing that, uh, usually not so broken, maybe a little younger, um, not necessarily needing individualized attention yet. <laughs> uh, usually the folks who are the ideal personal trainer client are maybe they've done that for a while and they've started aching a little bit. Maybe they've been sitting at the desk a little too long. So it is a very different population of fitness enthusiasts that are going for the small group and the online versus really needing the one-on-one -on -one individual attention. And that population who's needing the one-on-one, -on -one, again, it's like saying, is the trend of physical therapy going to go away? It'll never go away because people are always going to be broken. Fun fitness trends in group, yeah, yeah, they're a dime a dozen. They'll come and they'll go. But if folks can really, again, bridge that gap between a trainer and a physical therapist and offer a tool that they cannot get online, then they are golden. You know, it's funny. You, In some ways, you sort of stole my uh, the, the, the sort of response to my next question, which is what yeah. happens when the, re when, when the recession hits? You know, do, mm. do many of these you know, in some ways, fitness training is a is a discretionary expense that you know could be cut back in many households if folks are laid off. So, how do you? I mean, is is even the specialized corrective uh, fitness related therapy and, and training is that inelastic? I mean, it, does it go away or does it stay in in spite of you know a recession or a pretty big economic downturn? Right. The best example I can give you that is in two thousand eight during. Uh, that the recession that we experienced in, we had just opened Diakati uh, for about four years. Um, we did not experience a dip in any way. Things just slowed down in terms of new clients coming in. So again, I go back to my argument that folks will always be in need and probably even more in the future as folks continue to work harder at their desk and eat more poorly and have more issues physically with their body. They're going to need trainers and one-on-one -on -one unique individual attention even more uh, and maybe even more because of all the group fitness that they're doing <laughs> that it may not be appropriate for what's happening in their body and that's going to break their body down a little bit too uh, so yes I, I stand by the fact that uh, again those trainers who are connecting with their clients on a much deeper level and helping them uh, again correct their body have longevity in their joints uh, those folks are will be invaluable for many years to come Billy, what's next for you and Dia Kati? What should we be uh, cheering you on for uh, in the future? <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, the business movement, it, I've really kind of taken it on as a passion project. Uh, the my goal is that fitness professionals that are sitting behind a desk or, or working on the floor at a corporate facility and having to trade hours for pay every at 40 hours a week and just exhausting themselves in order to make ends meet. My goal is to help them have the tools and the resources to step out and do whatever they want and have the freedom to do whatever they want with their own independent practice or facility. So that is what you'll see more from us. We have just started enhancing our um, continuing education to offer a virtual classroom for entrepreneurs to learn everything from branding to marketing to website development uh, to differentiation. So if folks are needing help, you're asking earlier, how do folks find help? Uh, Again, our newsletter, we give out a free newsletter every month that's just packed with entrepreneur insights, uh, as well as our upcoming coursework and our virtual classroom experience. Uh, I really want people to feel like they can have access to the tools that they need in order to have their most successful life and, again, to find their happiness and fulfillment. And whether it be in a basement or not, <laughs> I, I am glad to help them do that. You know, you're speaking to the, the vision of uh, the professional on the go show. We want to make it possible for anyone to work for themselves and make a good living. And uh, yeah. it sounds like that's a, a huge part of what the business movement is about as well. Billy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a, oh, it's been a thank pleasure. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, if I can help out in any way more, you let me know. And Billy, it looks like in the long run, your technology degree now is coming in handy. Exactly. It's full, full circle, right? Exactly. <laughs> Another reason for your parents to be proud. Where can people get in touch with you if they want more information, get involved in what you're doing? Most definitely. The, it's thebusinessmovement.com. And everything is on there. The virtual classrooms, the newsletter, uh, our blog, again, just packed with a 
useful information to help people get a little catapult for their own business. So yeah, lots of free stuff on there. Reach out to me for one-on-one if I can help. It's all there. Thank you, Billy Paulson, for joining us. And I want to thank everyone for joining us for Professional on the Boat Go podcast. If you want more information on how you can run a business on a smartphone, go to www.pocketsuite.io. That's P-O-C-K-E-T-S-U-I-T-E.io. Look for us next time when we actually talk about why no one is cleaning their own houses and how the house cleaning business is just getting huge. Remember, your time is money. Being your own boss is not a job. It's a lifestyle. Ready, set, go.